Good afternoon and welcome to our Women and Money webinar. My name is Johan Goos and I'm the Head of Advice at Sasfin Wealth. Women are increasingly making their presence felt in society and the workplace as they grow their independence in, in various spheres of their life. Uh, but with this greater sense of independence um, also comes greater demands and responsibility. And, and one of these areas that can be very intimidating and stressful for both uh, men and women is the area of personal finances or money. Now, statistics tells us that 40% of households are headed by women, and they represent 53% of credit consumers. And this means that women plays a significant role in our economy when it comes to investing, saving, and spending. So joining us today uh, to discuss this very exciting but also personal and sensitive topic around money is a very passionate and experienced lady who I have had the privilege of getting to know in the past few months. She is not only on her own personal journey with money, but has also made it her career to assist others in finding their way to financial independence. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Alta Wittendahl. In many years in the corporate world, Alta decided to start her own private practice a few years ago. Now, Alta is a certified financial planner with a keen interest in the subject of behavioral finance, and she's also a registered Enneagram and NLP coach. Welcome to today's discussion, Alta. Thank you, Johan, and thanks for the opportunity, and welcome to all the ladies that's joining us, us this afternoon. Thank you. And we have um, Bongiwe Mimosa, who is a senior asset consultant at Sasfin Wealth, that is not only growing her influence throughout uh, or through being successful in her career, but also as a mother, and we look forward to Bungiwe sharing her journey and challenges when it comes to her money matters as a woman. Welcome, Bungiwe. Uh, thank you, Johan. Um, I feel honored to be a part of this conversation. I hold all of this very dear to, to my heart, and I'm happy to share my experiences, um, obviously, which have uh, been influenced by some of the stuff that we're going to talk to, which um, I think Alta kind of like works with on a daily basis. So thank right, you. Right, thank you. Looking forward. Really appreciate that you've joined us today. But Alta, let's jump straight into it. And I want to start off by asking you what financial freedom or independence really mean for women? You know, is it as simple as just having enough money or is there more to this, like being able to have discussions or conversations or make decisions about your own future and also meeting your own personal aspirational needs? Thank you, Jan. Yeah, it's a very important question. And I think, you know, that's the question that I normally ask my clients as well when I deal with people or when I want to empower them. I say to them, have you done any calculations? Because financial independence or freedoms really got a different meaning for everybody. You know, for one person, it can mean, you know, having a holiday home. For another person, it can mean, you know, having to educate my kids and take them to private universities. Um, and it all depends on really our values and our needs. And I think it's something that people do not discuss is what is really our core values in a family, in a society, and how does that beliefs and core values impact on my financial freedom and my independence, what I see as independence. Um, and it's really, when we talk to people and we discuss it with females, I say, you know, we need to actually almost get rid of this word that we get in the industry of retirement. Because retirement is, it, it's no difference than, um, you know, financial freedom and having financial independence. It's when you're no longer in survival mode and you've accumulated enough funds or a big enough net worth. And normally I ask clients, listen, how far are you building your net worth um, to get to a place where you're financially free or financially independent and you're no longer living in survival mode? So, and for that, we need a plan. Um, if we don't plan for anything in life, we will fail. And unfortunately, it's if we don't put any attention or intention to build financial freedom and build financial wealth, we will end up failing. We're going to learn the hard lessons. And yeah, we, we need to take responsibility for our own actions. 
questions. It's like going to the gym. If you don't go to the gym and you don't do it on a regular basis, you're going to fail. You're not going to get fit. We need to be financially fit. And, yeah, that financial independence is very different for different people. And it all depends on what is their values, what is their beliefs, and what is their needs for in terms of um, what does financial freedom mean to them um, in a number and lifestyle, uh, beliefs, what do they see as that? And it's, that's really individual conversations that we need to start having with clients. Yeah, and I think, and I, and I agree with that. I think, you know, one, one has to have uh, respect for the fact that independence, financial independence and freedom means different things uh, for different people. And hopefully we'll get to some of those things that we can look at, you know, getting that financial fit and getting out of the survival mode, because that is really is it, I suppose. It's getting out of the survival mode. But Pungiwe, what does the concept of financial independence mean to you as a woman? Um, thank you for this question, Johan. Um, I think... As we have seen the shift in the world in terms of the world just embracing women um, in terms of making their financial decisions, uh, becoming more literate when it comes to finances, I think I can definitely relate to to a time where, you know, I felt, you know, when I'm older, I want freedom. I want financial freedom. I didn't know what it looked like at the time, but when I when I think financial freedom now, I think being able to do what I want when I want. And obviously, I know where this comes from in terms of my values or what I deem important in my life. You know, having grown up in a, in a home where um, my mother, a single mother, you know, was, was uh, somebody who maybe had very little to go with. I knew that, you know, there would come a time where I would want more financial freedom than what I'm seeing now. And I think that has uh, uh, kind of shaped my decisions in terms of my my daily or day-to-day -day management of money and so as a result for me financial independence or financial freedom means more than just having a specific number you're able to to make decisions or the right decisions for yourself and make decisions that will have a lasting impact in, in terms of the legacy that you want to leave so once again, it goes back to that value that I hold very close uh, to me, that I want to be free. And freedom means that I'm able to make a specific decision re with regards to my money. And I'm able to, to make it and feel that it's going to have a, a, a lasting impact uh, in terms of what I'm trying to build from a legacy point of view. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, that is, is critical, you know, being true to yourself, your own values, um, you know, and I think, I think that is something that, again, comes back to just, you know, having a better understanding when you speak to people about money as well to really try and meet them where they are. But also, um, we know that there's a gender pay gap when it comes to the salaries that women earn relative to men. And there are also social norms in terms of how women are viewed in terms of their role in the home. But how do uh, women differ from men in how they think about money and how they handle money? For example, are they more conservative than men when it comes to money? Yes, thanks, Johan, for the question. I think uh, women tends to be more conservative. It all depends if they also contributing to the earning potential of the household and if they're educated, if, um, you know, what is the personal values, uh, you know, if they just want to be a mother. So it all depends, once again, on the females that we're talking to this afternoon. And it's important to understand all of us has got different values. You know, somebody just wants to be a mother, and then they don't want to get involved in all those type of decisions. But women tend to be more cautious. They tend to be more conservative. Um, statistics shows that. And also, I think they're coming from a more nurturing point of view, um, working with the emotional side, where I think, you know, males, you know, from, from the past, they're more analytical thinkers, they're also emotional beings, but they tend to not focus on the emotions that much. And I think going through different financial experiences, uh, we tend to be more conservative as females when we see what's happening around us um, and we know that we can possibly live 10 years longer than our male partners and we also have 
career breaks in most instances. Um, females will have career breaks because they've got, you know, kids in the house and, you know, they actually spend more time there. So the focus is not only on the career, but it's also on the nurturing of the family. So they tend to be more cautious, actually, in certain cases, uh, because they know that they need to also live. You know, they can possibly live for 10 years longer than their male partners. So statistics shows that we more emotional beings, we more nurturing beings, and that's where we more intuitive, I think, you know, when making financial decisions and therefore also more conservative uh, in financial planning. And it all depends on, it's not to say, you know, it's the bland approach because it all depends on our beliefs and our value systems that was created in early childhood. You know, so I think we tend to be more conservative if that answers your question. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think what you're saying here is, that the needs of men and women are different and therefore also your attitude towards money will most probably be different. And there's no good or bad. It's just making sure that whatever your needs and objectives are is pretty much aligned with your values and, and the way in which you handle money. But now I want to get onto a topic that I know that you're very passionate about. So, you know, based on research done around money psychology and behavioral finance, we make many decisions based on personal biases or beliefs um, that we are not even consciously aware of day to day. Now, as a wealth advisory business, you are also assisting our advisors at the moment in growing their awareness about our clients' potential financial blind spots, if we can call it that. But what are the most common subconscious threats for women when it comes to achieving financial independence? I think the biggest one, Johan, is one where we look at males and we think a male must make the financial decisions in the household. And I've seen it um, in the past We females will go through a divorce and they had this typical belief that the male was supposed to look after the finances, only later to realize when they go through a divorce that nothing is in place they were not um, part of the responsibility. They thought everything is in place. And then, you know, they realized that, um, you know, there was no accountability. But I always say to females, you know, you learn your lessons through going through hardship. And we must never take that lessons for granted. Because those lessons, it's a past belief system that um, comes through generations that the male, our male partners needs to make financial decisions. But in some cases, you know, I always ask clients, what was the example in their household when they grew up? Uh, was it good lessons or bad lessons? Maybe your lessons as a female was better lessons that you learned. And unfortunately, as we all know, you know, it's something that's not taught in schools, and it's really, there's a huge lack of financial, just basic financial knowledge um, around the world, actually. And the more we can educate and empower people, the more we can also get rid of this belief systems to say, listen, my male partner, you know, because my father, possibly from a previous generation, he was always accountable for making the money decisions. You know, we tend to subconsciously think the same. Um, and it's different for different uh, cultures. And I know we're going to talk about that later, but the belief systems, I think, is keeping us trapped. And uh, once again, another thing that I'm very interested about is really the personal types. Because we all have a different relationship of money. And it comes from our very subconscious beliefs. I've worked over the past 20 years with clients, and they were my greatest lessons. You know, for somebody that's got a belief system, I don't need to budget. And then later, only to realize, listen, but it's costing them dearly not to have a financial budget because it feels like a constraint for them. But there's no guidelines. There's no, um, they're not going to the financial fitness gym on a monthly basis to have those money conversations and to make sure that everybody is accountable for their part, um, you know, in the financial uh, wellness of the family, for example. So I think what we're hearing as well is, you know, we've had some good examples and we've had some not so good examples um, from the time that we were growing up as children. And we know that 
also a lot of our personality is pretty much formed by the time we're six. And um, sometimes some of those role models have a major or, or not so great role models have a major impact on, on also our, how we conduct our financial lives. But we also spoke earlier about the difference between men and women when it comes to dealing with money. Um, what would you say are women's unique strengths when it comes to dealing with money? Um, I think the unique strengths for us is that we emotional beings and we tend to feel maybe more of the financial, you know, I always say to people, you can, you can make any statement. And if I ask the ladies this afternoon, how confident are you making your own financial decisions? You will feel it in your body to say a statement like, I'm feeling comfortable making financial decisions on a daily basis. If you can't say that and you feel some kind of stress in your body, you know you don't have the confidence. So if I look at the female partners, we're much more intuitive. Um, I think we tend to also feel it in our bodies. We, we, the nurturers, so the emotional side, I think is more developed, although um, coming from a very left brain orientated financial industry where I only look at the numbers and I'm more in the thinking triad, you know, I'm a thinker, I'm not that emotional being, it actually helped me trying to understand clients. And we need to understand our relational fears. And I think women, because we are nurturers, we need to understand our own relational fears and how to overcome those barriers within our personality types to actually make greater, you know, financial decisions in our lives. Because it's everything is, you know, it's energetically programmed in our bodies. And it's all how the brain is programmed, as you mentioned, from a very early age. But we are more emotional, more intuitive. And my personal opinion, there's no right or wrong. It's everybody will have a different perspective. And we can also learn a lot from our male partners because sometimes females cannot make financial decisions. They're too emotional. And that's where we need to have that little bit of power in us to help us to make us, you know, make those important financial decisions. Sometimes we can procrastinate. We can go into analysis paralysis uh, where our male partners in some cases, um, and it's also again, once in their personality type, it's they've got the confidence, they've got the power, and they can make more informed financial decisions at that stage. And for me, it's nobody's right and nobody's wrong. We need to learn from each other and we need to embrace each other's strengths and weaknesses um, to empower each other. And um, yeah, that's my message really this afternoon. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. We need to learn from each other. So, so there are some positives uh, in terms of specific strengths that women have, but sometimes we should also be careful that some of those strengths don't actually turn against our ability to make the right financial decisions. And I think the other thing that's come through very strongly, and we'll get to that uh, a little bit later, is this whole issue of relationships and how two people can actually help each other to um, achieve their financial goals as well. But Bongiwe, uh, do you believe that you as a woman have an edge on men in certain respects when it comes to dealing with money? Um, certainly, Johan. I think um, when it comes to dealing with uh, money, because I mean, like uh, Alta has mentioned now, we tend to be more intuitive. I think women tend to embody values such as being resourceful, being economical, and I think even values such as mindfulness, which I think puts us in a position where we are better, um, we're able to better align our, our actions or activities in terms of uh, what we want to achieve uh, financially. But obviously there is that fear of, am I making the right decisions? Because I think for the longest time, we, weren't, we, we didn't have access to the right information or uh, even our confidence when it comes to money was always just something that took a back seat. So from that perspective, sometimes we do doubt ourselves in terms of the decisions that we make, but I think we really do possess some strengths from a, an emotional perspective or just some of the values that we embody as women, which kind of uh, maybe lends us in a better space in terms of uh, 
how we manage money, especially from a perspective of being impulsive. You, you know that you, you are a resourceful person or you align yourself to be somebody who's resourceful or economical. So you're not just going to go willy-nilly and make decisions that will have a negative impact in terms of your, of your finances. We've got certain beliefs and values, and I think you, you spoke about that a bit earlier on, that, and, and, and we, those, those beliefs and values shaped our environment, our circumstances, and our society. Um, you know, if you look at your beliefs and your values, um, how do you think do they influence your day-to-day money decisions? Um, thanks, Johan. Yes, of course. I, I do believe that um, we don't arrive at our financial decisions by accident. My values and life experiences uh, uh, certainly have had a great influence on my daily money decisions. Um, my beliefs uh, influence where I spend my money, my overall financial behavior as a result. So, for instance, I relate to, like I said uh, previously, to money freedom and I know where this comes from. It comes from a place where I thought, you know, there is a day where I want to be able to do what I want whenever I I want it. And growing up under um, a single mother, like I said, who had very little to go with uh, from a financial perspective, I, I, I can trace that back to that. And that has obviously influenced the decisions that I've made in terms of my money matters, and I think what's important uh, for us women is, is not to bury our heads in the sand and, and just think, okay, we're going to go through every day not knowing how your behavior was influenced by your past life because that has um, quite a, a big impact. I, I think with um, Alta's uh, comment on, on how your mind is programmed from quite an early age in terms of how you behave later on in life, I think that's something that we need to embrace with no judgment, of course. But obviously, some of the things need to be corrected as you as you progress and you grow older and realize that uh, money uh, or financial independence or freedom means uh, certain things to you. And for you to be able to achieve those, you need to translate those values or what you deem to be important into activities on a daily basis that will get you to that to that point. Yeah, and I think you you mentioned something now as well. It's very important this whole issue of also about judging yourself, because sometimes we are so hard on ourselves and we just don't give ourselves any forgiveness for for things we've done in the past, and we just can't you know move on. But but also you you were just um, missing the question maybe that I was asking um, or Pungiwa. I was talking about the fact that um, you know that from the day we are born, our personality and our beliefs and values are shaped uh, by our environment and our circumstances in society, and and how does our beliefs and values shape our money decisions? Sure. Johan, um, there's so many things that's got an impact on our money beliefs, and we all got a money story. Um, It comes from our core fears as as children, and we, we grew up, they reckon actually in society and for different cultures, it's very different. So we all have different um, cultural beliefs and values according to that. But it's got a huge impact. And I think what we're getting wrong still in the financial industry is that we don't um, get to the core values and beliefs when we talk to clients. And we don't understand that. And we, we try to give advice from our perspective and what we think you know, must be important for this person. And I think that's why a lot of communication, trust, there's a lot of barriers to deeper connections. Because if I cannot tell you, and I think sometimes it makes it very difficult for clients because clients do not understand what they think about money and how do they feel about money. And no relationship can go to a deeper level if I cannot explain my needs. And it's important that everybody for every human being that we are able to express our own needs. And when I say expressing our own needs without being judged, without being criticized for not being shamed for having needs, um, and to understand how to express that needs by saying how, how we feel and how we think about money, we cannot create a deeper relationship. So what typically happens then is if I cannot express my own thinking and my own feelings around money, 
what typically will happen is I will manipulate people to get the same outcome. And that's where manipulation happens is because I subconsciously want to get those needs and it's core needs according to my fear patterns. That's was programmed in very early childhood. And that's all about behavioral finance. But those core needs, I'm going to try at all cost to get that need or to get it met by whatever, whatever is around me. But, um, and that's what we don't understand is that we cannot have deeper relationships. We cannot trust people. If I cannot express my needs and my feelings to anybody and how I think about money. And that's really um, where we need to get, because otherwise I'm going to use manipulation and all kinds of um, other things to get that same needs met. And it comes from fear-based thinking um, that was created early in childhood. And I love it because we can all be much more healthier. At the end of the day, a financial mistake Sometimes nothing to do with finances, but it's um, holistically looking at our mental health and our emotional health. Because if we're not emotionally healthy and we do not understand our own fears, motivations for our decisions that we make on a daily basis, we will make money mistakes because it comes from a very subconscious um, pattern. I always say to people, you know, your net worth to the world is normally um, you know, uh, determined but by what you deduct or, you know, what remains after you, your bad habits are deducted from your good ones. And it's really, um, if I think of behavioral finance, it's very easy to explain to clients what is the difference on interest rates, how to do a stake plan for a client. But if you don't understand your um, patterns that you always want to spend money and you've got this core fears of being trapped and you want that freedom and you want the next best experience. And that's your core values and needs. You're going to start spending money there instead of uh, to, to fill the empty void inside. And it comes from fear-based thinking. I know it's very deep now, but it's really our money behaviors and patterns that we show on the outside is also showing us what's wrong inside. And we need to ask the questions What's happening inside that I'm projecting on the outside? Yeah, I don't so know we, if we, anybody. No, I mean, so, 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 so you've got these factors that's influencing your, your money beliefs. And then going with that is also just what, and I don't know if you can say if there's something like a money personality type, but um, there's also your kind of like your, your preferences of, of how you like to engage with the world and the people around you. So how do you like to gather information? How do you like to make your decisions and how do you choose to live your life, be it more organized or more like, you know, let's see where, where the situation takes us. But also maybe to make it a little bit more personal, uh, what single lesson can you maybe tell us about that you've learned about money? Sure, Johan, it's a big lesson for me. It was really a big lesson for me. Um, being a financial advisor, being a, fun, you know, know everything about risk planning, you know, advanced estate planning. And sometimes you realize, listen, clients will procrastinate. And I was a procrastinator for eight years. I had all the knowledge in the world, but I could not help people. And it was very close friends, one example was very close friends that I could not help. And I felt like a failure. And then my best example was in a bigger family situation. And I really felt like a failure because, yeah, I've got all the knowledge in the world. I've got all the legal technical knowledge, but I cannot implement a solution. And then I realized that people, will people please, you know, to be, um, and it's all really to do with relational fears and unhealthy personality patterns because they use manipulation actually uh, to get the same needs met, but through, you know, to, to use it on the, on the wrong side because they use it from a fear-based thinking pattern. And what's really creating anxiety, I had some severe anxiety, to be honest, and I think everybody experiences anxiety right now, um, and it comes from, yeah, you've got all the knowledge, but you don't understand your insight. And it took me to a, a journey that I'm very happy I took on this journey. And I looked at the inside. I said, 
but where's the mistake that I'm making? Why can I not make these financial decisions? And it came back from, the answers came back from my belief systems, my relational fears that I had that I could not overcome, and now and within my personality type as well. So I can see risks way in advance because I'm a brilliant risk management type of person. That's my gifts. But if I don't manage that, it can also create anxiety for me. So we all got our blessings, and sometimes our blessings can be our curse. And that's how I really, um, why I'm passionate about financial behaviors and the behavioral finance field, because if we don't shine a light on those relational fears and our core personality type, it will run our lives from a subconscious perspective. And we're going to call it fight and say, this is just happening to me. But we can manage it. It's if we understand ourselves and we, if we do have that self-awareness. And I'll be right. honest, I actually, you know, tried to give advice to clients. They did not implement my advice. I was lying awake at night because people did not implement my solution. And, and it's not the highest value for them to have financial security. We, for me, it was a core value. And it's, you know, that's why I studied it. And, but I did not understand my personality time. Mm. I think that's no, really my breakthrough. Yeah, thanks for that. Bungiwe, tell us about your uh, one lesson that you have learned about money. Sure. I think as a, as a young uh, woman, as a young mother, I think, I, I, I mean, after joining the workforce, obviously, you know, you think, oh, you're getting all this money. It looks like you have lots of money from month to month. But I think after a year, I sat and I thought, okay, what have I done in this first year of, you know, my work life? Or well, besides getting myself a car, which I thought I needed. But I think what the lesson was for me was that the strategy of living from paycheck to paycheck is a very dangerous strategy because you could land yourself uh, up in a position where you are now relying on short-term uh, debt or your credit card just to fill up those emergencies. And obviously, this is, this is, once again, something that's influenced by your past life experiences or lack of uh, financial literacy where you're not proactive in terms of managing your finances. But obviously, I think um, there's, there's lots of ways to correct that. There are people like Alta here who can um, assist you, you know, correct those behaviors. But I think the biggest lesson for me was that alongside other small, smaller lessons where I think your day-to-day -day spend, you, you don't realize those small amounts actually add up. You sit at the end of the month uh, with your budget and think, wow, okay, I've actually spent quite a lot on, on the small items. You know, it could be your coffee today, another maybe packet of whatever, you know, in the afternoon. But all of those things add up. And if you're not um, mindful of where your daily um, uh, expenses are, are, are actually are going. You could actually even be moving on a monthly, on a month-to-month -month basis, ending up in overdrafts or, or that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, no, I think, you know, that you, you're saying such an important thing. You know, you can go through the motions and it's just like you receive an amount of money every month, but you're actually not intentionally going you know, anywhere with that. And it also speaks to this whole issue um, you know, of the fact that we've got a responsibility that's been given to us in terms of every single rand um, that we receive. And, you know, I just read something the other day to say that for every one rand you save, you are financially more free because you will have to depend less on somebody else in the future. I just saw there was a question around, um, you know, uh, where do you start with financial education? And maybe just one book that I can suggest to the people um, that's on this webinar at the moment is a book that's called, Why Didn't They Teach Me This in School? It's by Kerry Siegel. And it's got 99 um, money management principles that you can look at. And we'll also make that um, information available afterwards uh, after our session today. Um, but then I want to move on to something that's, I think, quite relevant for our specific um, kind of situation in South Africa. We are a rainbow nation. We live in a very diverse society. Alta, what influence does culture and the way we have been raised 
um, and how we deal with our finances uh, influence our ability to achieve financial independence. Is, are there some positives or is it negative? Thanks, Johan, for the question. I think it comes back to a belief pattern and it is in different countries, you will have different um, you know, structures also. You know, if you look at um, some countries where there's a lot of um, social, you know, national health insurance, you know, people don't um, tend to worry about money so much than South Africa, for example. I spoke to people in um, Dubai and those areas and, and how they live there. It's totally different than what we experience here in South Africa. Also, what happens is because of the different cultures, I mean, some cultures we know that the eldest son needs to look after the mother or these three generations living in the same household. So it all depends on your culture and, you know, your belief systems. And uh, one example that I can maybe, you know, share with Alicia is that sometimes we will go to people and I think we need to be just aware of our own belief systems and how we sometimes project our own belief systems, our own values onto other people because we are such a diverse cultural you know um, society in south africa we sometimes project our cultural beliefs and our cultural values onto other people and we need to be aware of that and that's really where i say we need to create a mind of curiosity is if if i want to understand you on a much deeper level i need to understand what is your cultural beliefs what is your cultural values what is your desires in terms of financial freedom and financial independence? Because if I give it to you from my perspective, you know, I can maybe miss you totally. And you're going to say, listen, but um, Alta, you do not understand me. Or you're going to walk away as financial, you know, if I was your financial advisor, because I don't understand you. And I think really is to take into account the different values, the different beliefs of the cultures, but also to learn from each other. Because we can also learn from each other uh, through the different cultural beliefs and values that we've got, because it might, makes us such a richer, you know, society. Um, but definitely the country even uh, plays a huge role. Um, around the world, people will have different uh, money values and beliefs according to what that society actually created for them. And I think that's important to understand, but also to embrace I don't know if that, that actually answered your question, Johan. Yeah, I know it does. But, uh, I mean, let's go to Bungiwe. I mean, Bungiwe, how would you say your cultural background shaped your relationship with money? Um, look, I'll start with just my upbringing. Um, I think we were expected to be very economical with whatever resources we had. I've grown to embrace that. I mean, there was a time where I thought, well, I've got money now, I can do whatever I want. But I think I kind of like went back to who am I? What are my values? What am I trying to achieve? And as a result, I started um, embracing or embodying uh, that value of being economical. I respect people who are economical, but at the same time, I know that a good pair of shoes and maybe a bottle of bubbly here and there is something that I enjoy buying. I mean, these are some of my favorite things that I'd like to spend on, but they also cost money. So it's striking that balance for me, you know, in terms of my values, what am I trying to achieve? And also bring that back to the daily activities in terms of uh, managing my money. And I think the important thing is knowing where this comes from. I embrace it. I don't judge myself. I do know that there was a point in time where I wasn't very economical with my resources, but I've, I've had to learn because I knew that would get me in a place where I wasn't free financially or independent. So yes, certainly the past experiences, your upbringing definitely have an impact in terms of how you view money or how you relate uh, uh, to money. And I think similarly to somebody who was raised in an environment where um, there was a lot of, you know, financial literacy around them, that person will likely be more proactive in terms of how they manage their money later on in life. So yes, good and bad, but I think it all comes back to your awareness in terms of what values are you embodying or embracing and where do you want to go 
um, with that and what actions can you actually uh, take if you have blind spots what can you take to rectify um, are those mistakes what actions can you take to rectify those mistakes Giwa, actually, I actually want to stay with you um, and just ask you this. Um, you know, when it comes to seeking advice, um, uh, you know, what is your preference uh, from who do you seek uh, advice when it comes to money as a woman? I think for me, it's changed over time. Obviously, when I felt like I didn't have a lot of responsibilities, it was easy to have these discussions with my mother. And I mean, I could rely on the low knowledge that she had in terms of finances. But then I think as I grew older and also became a mother, I realized that maybe I do need, you know, professional help, somebody who's going to help me clarify my goals a bit more and also help me with, you know, getting the right information and help me with making informed decisions. Yes, they won't make the decisions for you. The onus is on you to actually uh, um, act on those, on, on whatever information you, you have at your disposal. But now I do make use of a professional who will help me uh, kind of chart my plan for life, which is something that I, I, I deem very uh, important to have a plan because like Alta said, if you don't have a plan, you're just preparing to fail. So it was more informal when I started working, but now I do make use of uh, professional help. And that's great because, you know, you need somebody that is independent in terms of, you know, your thinking and your specific biases. You also need somebody that you can trust and that can hold you accountable uh, and work with the plan and, and stick to that plan. But also, you know, men usually do not ask for directions and this also extends to the financial advice. But do you think women are more likely to ask it, uh, for advice? Uh, Johan, I think it all depends once again. For some females, uh, you know, I've had lots of money discussions and with people and they say, you know, if I ask them, you know, what is the money situation? How do, especially if I tell them what I do, they will sometimes say to me that I don't know anything. And I normally say to them, you know, it's on their side. If you give the responsibility to anybody else in your life, you need to be 100% sure that you are comfortable with that decision. Because it can cost us dearly if we give the, we assign the responsibility of our financial well-being to somebody else and we don't take that responsibility. To come back to asking directions, I always say to people, you know, if we want to empower ourselves, we have to ask the questions. You know, a teachable spirit, if you don't have a teachable spirit, you know, you actually don't, you've got a weakness. And because we can learn so much from each other. And I think if your own insecurities, it's really insecurities, and I don't say all men are insecure, please do not get me wrong on this. But I think we tend to, if you have to, you have to get to a place of curiosity to say, listen, but tell me more. Tell me more. Why do you feel this way? Why do you need this? Instead of just having a black and white thinking, because I think we easily say, you know, um, men won't ask for directions. And it sometimes can be a blind spot for them because they tend to think, listen, well, the decisions that they make, we need to respect and we need to appreciate that. But it can be that they had the most terrible, um, you know, parents giving them the life lessons and they go through life, never had any financial education, never had any financial examples. And at the, at the end of the day, it will be to the detriment of the whole family. So I think, you know, it's always, you need to actually look at yourself and ask yourself, why do I feel, why does it trigger me if somebody is asking me, listen, um, you know, what is blocking me that I won't ask anybody? Because it's showing a point of um, I, I'm not prepared to empower myself myself as a male. And I think it comes back to, you know, having a teachable spirit is really why we are here on planet Earth is to learn from each other, to not make the same mistakes. And yeah, males has got lots of knowledge and we can embrace it. Um, and we've got not, lots of knowledge and we can also embrace it. Yeah. Um, 
think for anybody, because sometimes female, females will also not ask that question. And it's also a lack on our side because they tend to, once again, it can be a belief system. I need to rely on my partner or somebody else for that. So, yeah, um, it's, it's actually a weakness for me if I can't ask and empower myself. Mm. I want yeah. to go, but I want to make the same mistakes and I need to ask questions. Mm. Sure, I'm just watching the time there, and it's amazing how time is flying, and there's so many questions I still want to ask you. But also on that point, um, how far have we come in breaking down this belief that men are the money masters of the universe uh, and, and of their homes? Sure, Johanny, that's a huge one, um, very huge one for me, and I've seen it um, over the past 20 years, that the reason people will divorce is because of money. And I've, I've experienced a lot of people that went through, the, through a divorce and it's because there's a money fight. And I truly believe we don't need to have those money fights if we understand each other. But the problem is we think we understand each other without clear communication. Now, if I understand somebody on a much deeper level, I understand therefore, you know, their core fears, their core motivations for all their decisions I, I, I know it changed my life and it, it changes the relationship with what you've got with the people. It changes the way you communicate because we actually do get deeper relationships in life. We need to get vulnerable. And I think that's maybe the answer to your question that you asked about males asking direction is they put in a place where they don't want to feel vulnerable. And it's only through vulnerability that we can create deeper relationships. And sometimes I know it's very difficult to look at yourself and to say, listen, but here's my weaknesses. But we all got weaknesses. We, nobody's perfect. And to go and create those deeper relationships is to also be vulnerable. And more and more women is getting more empowered in making financial decisions. They're also earning uh, bigger salaries, they're taking over the roles, you know, in corporate positions, they're making uh, an impact on the lives in their families as well. And I think it's really, is how can we take hands and embrace this and say, you know, get rid of all the beliefs, but we work in a partnership, embracing strengths and weaknesses within any partnership, maybe in a, in a, in a corporate you know, being around a table of only CEOs and um, it's really to use the strengths of, of everybody and to understand the weaknesses of different individuals. Yeah. So, so what we're saying is that, you know, a relationship can be totally destructive um, or it can actually be constructive depending on how willing to the two parties are, are to, to share and discuss the real money matters. And I think, you know, we're very aware in our country, unfortunately, of the sad reality of physical abuse, but I think there's also a lot of financial abuse that actually happen in homes. And that's just, for example, very simply by not sharing certain pertinent information about your financial position and leaving the other party in a very uncertain and unsafe space in terms of where you are financially. But Bungiwe, uh, maybe a question to you would then be, um, what would you as a woman expect from a relationship uh, when it comes to money matters? Um, sure, Johan. <laughs> I think uh, personally, it all, one, I think these conversations should happen very early in the relationship. And really, I just expect to have discussions about what each of us uh, judge to be important. So going back again to what your values are and your beliefs. Are you a charitable person? Because that will obviously have an impact on our monthly budget. Are you a big spender? Are you impulsive in your spending? And I think, you know, importantly, that thing that I mentioned about living uh, from paycheck to paycheck, is, is that your strategy? And we need to correct those things. And obviously, um, our money stories are different. And... I think what often happens is that um, where you feel like you're, you're, you have bad habits or you know, negative patterns, 
it sometimes feels like when you have to sit and describe these out loud, it may feel like a confession or you're being judged. But I think the important thing is to establish that safe space where you can both uh, come together and, you know, just air everything out from your value system, your beliefs, what has influenced your, your choices in terms of how you spend or deploy your resources, which obviously in this case is money. Um, and I don't expect this to be a once-off exercise because our goals and needs change on a daily basis. But I think the important thing is to have that conversation quite early on in the relationship and just create a platform where the other person feels safe, whether they've had or they've made the worst decisions in the past. The important thing is how do you then correct those uh, going forward? Yeah, no, so, you know, I mean, you, you're talking about something that's so important, and you mentioned right at the beginning, it's communication, having those communications as early as possible, but Alta, the problem is that we know that many relationships run into huge problems as a result of a lack of communication, and then when it gets to money, it becomes even harder to have those discussions, so how, as a woman, um, would you deal with a partner that does not want to speak about personal finances? Um, Johan, I think it's important that we have money conversations on a monthly basis, especially if I, I see any marriage as a partnership. It's like you're part of my company and we built wealth together and really we need to be both accountable. So my personal opinion on this is I need to understand your weaknesses and it's coming back to what Pongiwe actually mentioned. I always say, any company, how do we run a company? We've got a budget. And that's our accountability partner. It takes out all the emotions that we've got around the financial decisions that we need to make. It's taking out the emotions. And we want to try and make decisions taking out the emotions. Because emotions happen very much on a subconscious level. And to have an accountability partner like your budget, like any other company, is this is the guidelines that we work with. Um, and that is how we work. And the reason for that is, Johan, why I'm so passionate about it is because once again, both is wrong and both is right. And the reason why I'm saying that is we attract opposites, especially in a marriage, you will attract the opposite because you see something in somebody else that you don't see in yourself. And we're there to balance, it, balance each other. So both of our perspectives can be wrong. But it's how do we create balance? And to use a simple example, is sometimes you will have a saver and a spender, normally, getting married to each other. And the person that's only focusing and almost creating anxiety because they want to just save, 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 save. It's also unhealthy because we need to live life. We need to also have some, you know, some joy in life. It doesn't help we save and then we die one day with tons and tons of money but uh, we didn't enjoy that. And then on the other side, you normally marry a spender and the spender is to, there to actually give you that balance. So the moment we understand how our two strengths and the two weaknesses of a partner actually help each other to heal and to get to meet each other halfway, and that's really communicating, understand each other, having the self-awareness, to meet each other halfway, have an accountability partner like a budget, and then, you know, the, it takes out all the emotional stress from financial planning and running a budget, and people can actually test it in their bodies. I normally use a body level exercise to say, how do you feel if somebody mentioned a budget to you? Do you feel contracted or do you feel free? And if you feel free, you know, you know you're happy about it, but sometimes people live also in denial. You know, you get people that say, I don't want to talk about a budget, and they live in denial. And niceness can cost you your life. Um, by putting up a happy face and not dealing with reality can also cost you money. So I think to understand each other on a much deeper level, communication, you know, those are our answers to creating financial stability in households, within companies, because we all got blind spots. And it's to embrace each other, but also to do it not from an anxiety and fear-based yeah. thinking, but to understand how it impacts our lives. Yeah. 
So I just want to ask one, each one of you another question before we go into closing comments from your side. But uh, there's a question that we received to say, you know, kind of like, how do I take control and get more discipline in terms of my money spending behaviors? So, Bungibe, from your personal experience, what are some of the immediate practical actions that women can take to gain more control of their financial future? I think some of the uh, immediate things that you can do, I think this, look, this has worked for me, um, getting a better handle of your day-to-day -day spending because that influences your long-term. It, it, it may seem harmless at the time, but when you look back, you're going to realize that you've actually dented your pocket by quite a, a significant amount. And once again, I, I believe that the good old budget still works and people should have a budget. If you don't have a budget, then there's no ways that you can check your spending, your saving or your investments. So I think those two things for me are very important. And I think the, the other one, which sometimes kind of comes across as daunting to people is that of a financial plan. But really it just means that you must seek help. If you don't know how to draw that, seek help. What are your goals? What are your desires? What are your blind spots? A professional will help you with kind of like clarifying all of those and making yeah. sure that you gain or are working towards some financial freedom on a, on a yeah. daily basis. And, and, and that's great, you know, and because before you can get to financial planning, you have to have that budget. The budget, it starts and ends with the budget and it doesn't have to be a complicated thing. You know, for example, just take an average of three months worth of statements, your bank statements, your credit cards, get an idea of what the average spend is over the three months. You'll get a good idea of what you're spending per month on what items. And then you just start by uh, looking to see, are you uh, within your budget? Are you outside of your budget? And from there on, start working towards some goals. But also, you know, um, we know that the COVID pandemic has brought an extra dimension of financial strain to many households and even more so to women who have to juggle their jobs and more having, uh, having to spend more time uh, on childcare. But what will be your advice to any women out there that are experiencing financial stress or even anxiety right now? Thanks, Johan, for that question. And I think it's going to be Come a very important discussion point for us over the next three to six months, even maybe next two years. Um, financial distress is causing also mental health issues. And I really think that self-care is extremely important. Is we need to look after ourselves because we get into a vicious cycle. The more we worry, the more, you know, we the brain hormones, you know, we feel it in our body, we create more stress, you know, and we worry again, but it doesn't help us worrying about it over and over again. Sometimes we just need to distance ourselves from it a bit. And sometimes I think we all know that we need to take a break and just, and I know it's sometimes difficult. I talk to people and they say to me, I can't take a break. But if you if you can't take a break, you will never have the clarity on how to move forward in life because it's that anxiety that will keep you trapped because you're actually living in fight and flight mode. And the brain is actually brilliant. You know, it's, it's a, you know, our human brain is so important. If we're too fearful and we live in fear, financial distress, and the anxiety is building up, we can't make conscious decisions. We need to break that pattern of stress. And the only way we can do it is through self-care exercises. And I normally say to people, you will feel it in your body. The anxiety, putting up that niceness face is going to cost you. Um, if you feel angry and you're putting up a nice face, it's going to cost you in your body. And it's such a holistic approach because at the end of the day, we're going to have physical health issues if we don't take care of our own anxiety our own mental health, because it's, it's a holistic approach. And self-care right now is extremely important. But if I talk about self-care, we need to not look outside and blame other people. We need to ask ourselves, what is this anxiety that I'm feeling right now? What is it saying to me? And I need to go inwards. And the moment we're looking for answers, 
part of ourselves, we will get the breakthrough experiences. And it's normally through the hard times that we learn our greatest lessons. We never learn a great lesson in comfort zones. And we need to embrace this from a personal development point of view. We can all come out, out of COVID um, understanding ourselves on a much deeper level. And that is my call this afternoon to every person out there. Understand your own inside. It's got nothing to do with the outside. Is if you understand your own anxieties that you're creating through your thoughts, your feelings, and your beliefs. Thanks, Alta. So I'm going to end off here because we've run out of time and there's still, still some questions that's come through that I want to answer. But Bungiwe, maybe just as a closing remark, if there's one thing that you will say to a new generation of women um, when it comes to money and achieving financial independence, what would that one message be? Uh, sure, if I were to... Look, I, let me just say I like this new generation of women. I think first and foremost, we kind of like understand... Um, how to create wealth. We have, I think, used uh, methods or tools outside of the traditional ones in terms of how we can actually create wealth. And we have seen more and more women asserting themselves as decision makers um, over a wide range of finance-related matters. And I think the important thing is, is even if you are a baby boomer woman or millennial or even Generation Z, the important thing is to have that plan. Know your values. Understand where they come from, how you were influenced uh, in, by your upbringing or your past experiences. And that will help you in terms of understanding who you are with no judgment. Because a lot of the mistakes that we make is when we feel that we are, we are judged or we actually start by judging ourselves before people actually even judge us. So I think that that would be the key message for me. Have that plan and it will, it will help you a great deal. You are going to move through life knowing what your blind spots are, how you can fix them and, you know, be actually excited about living and, and not just go through life, not knowing, you know, living from paycheck to paycheck and relying on short term debt it's, a, it's a, a very bad cycle that you can get into. But if you have a plan, you will, you will not fail. I think the planning thing is the key thing for me and mm. just yeah. knowing your goals and your values. Yeah, and, 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 you, and, and you must find that plan that works for you. Thank you, Bungiwe. And then Correct. just from you, Alta, very briefly, what would be that one message to a new generation of women about money and achieving financial independence? Start with small steps and one step at a time. It's having that one money conversation that you were very scared to have in the past. And it's also facing our own fears um, and not to be fearful because there's always help. And if you are prepared to listen, there's a lot of people that's prepared to help. So taking one step at a time, facing your own fears, your own demons and you know, moving forward one step at a time. Thank you very much. Alta, I'm going to be asking you uh, for some advice in terms of some good books that you can suggest for women to read about money and achieving financial independence, because that's also been a question that's come up. But um, that really concludes our discussion for today. We would love to have carry on and maybe we can do another session at some time. But the key message I take out from this discussion um, is that financial independence for women is a very deep personal and a far-reaching topic. And it's important for women to allow themselves enough space and time to better understand their own money fears and beliefs in order for them to make better financial decisions and to allow them to grow in their relationship with money and with their partners. And I think by facing these fears and, and, and challenging some of, of, of the misguided beliefs about money resulting from personal experience or due to cultural influences, um, women can empower themselves uh, and be better equipped to travel the journey of financial independence. And it's so critical for, for the women of today to pass on the skills and the lessons learned about money to the next generation of women in whom such, so much of, of the hope of financial libera liberation lies. And I really hope that each and every woman that attended this women, uh, webinar gained some new insights uh, or found some value from what was shared during the discussion today. And I really want to thank Alta and Bungiwe for their time and for sharing their passions and their hearts 
and personal experiences with us today. And thank you again for making the time to attend our discussion.